What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Well Man's Podcast. My name is Brian Brosey. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Keone Tita. Keone, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Brian? Hey, everybody. Thanks for being out there. Brian and I thought we would um, talk about uh, tips for fat loss since the holidays are coming up. So let's just jump right in. Let's do it. All right. So one of the um, things that I always hear, and you probably heard this too, Brian, is like, when is the best time to work out? Hmm. Ah, the age old question, the one that really, really matters. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when is the best time to work out? What does the preponderance of research seem to say about that? And there's some different takes on it, but I'd have to say probably the best time to work out is first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, before you eat, get it done. And one of the reasons why is because if you wait until the evening, what happens is, is you drain that willpower battery and most likely you're going to make up excuses or whatever for not going. You have a whole day at work, you've been drained, you have stress, yeah. drains that willpower battery, you can make excuses, you get home, you sit in front of TV, you want to relax. Um, it's likely not going to happen. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the absolutely. Other, so, but the, and then the other reason is, is you just got off a fast all night and now you're going to go work out for however long, 20, 30 minutes, hour or whatever. And what you do is you get to increase that fat burning that's going on. You get to deplete your glycogen stores um, and enhance fat burning. And after you work out, then you're probably going to be hungry and that's probably the best time to eat. So I'd say the best time to work out is in the morning for those two main reasons with the exception of what if you're not getting enough sleep? Mm -hmm. So then I go to the place, well, you should probably just stay in bed if you're not getting enough sleep and try to work out in the evening. I mean, what what are your thoughts on that? Well, so I got a bunch of thoughts, but first, Keone, I was wondering just in your mind, what is enough sleep? I think over eight hours is over eight, over eight. So if you got less, let's say someone got, I don't know, six hours and 45 minutes or seven hours of sleep that you would suggest that they do not work out that day. Yes. And I would gauge that on what their subjective feeling is too. But yes, I would suggest that they, and that subjective feeling is not always truth telling, right? Mm -hmm. Mm Because you you wake up, you have this uh, big surge of cortisol, gets you up, you have the lights on, you're ready to go, you're you're spinning your wheels. But over time, I think it's a problem. Okay, yeah. All right, so I'd say eight and a half hours, but there's caveats to that with our sleep episode that we did a while back, you know, it, it really depends on how much deep sleep you're getting. Mm-hmm. How much recovery sleep you're getting? Are you going through all the all the stages, or are you asleep and just getting light sleep, and you're there for eight and a half hours? You know, so it'd probably be better to get six, seven hours deep, you know, deep total time, and make sure you're getting like an hour and a half, two hours of deep sleep, than getting eight hours of light sleep, waking and stuff like that. And there's really no way for most of us to assess that, except with some of these biometric tools out there. Like, you know, the one I use is the, uh, here it is, the aura ring. Right? Oh, nice. So, yeah. It came in. It came in. Yeah. You, you like so, it, Keone? Oh, I, I do because I, it's great for assessing sleep and they're not like a hundred percent accurate, but, but over time for you, you watch the trend with yourself. You can see right. how much sleep you're getting. Right. But you know, we're talking so, about the beginning of the, the, what, 20th century people were getting like, um, I think the research says over eight hours. And I think that's something that we should shoot for eight to eight to nine hours of sleep. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, and, and, and the caveat to that is, is to get the deep sleep, it seems, you know, you want to go to bed between like eight thirty and 10. You know, okay. So the, so the earlier you go, the more deep sleep you're, you're getting. Yeah. So, so with fat loss, you know, sleep is a huge thing. If you're not getting enough sleep, then it probably would be better for you to stay in bed that extra hour. And then you may, your willpower battery may not be so drained by the end of the day if you're getting that extra sleep to work out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that helps. That helps like like change my position when you specifically talk about fat loss, because I'm one of those people where even if I get seven hours of sleep, I need my exercise mentally, whether that's even a jog on that one day. Um, or something super light for 20 or 25 minutes. But 
going back to the original question of when is the perfect time to work out? This is stuff I see with my personal training clients a lot. These are fantastic questions that really just don't matter at all. <laughs> like <laughs> at the end of the day, I just work out and then that would be step one. But right. I would agree with you, especially for me, um, that the best time for me is in the is in the morning before I've kind of depleted that willpower reserve, like you're saying, after I yeah. after I come back from yeah, same here. eleven or so days at the clinic, I am or eleven hours or so at the clinic, I am not super juiced to go torture myself for 35 minutes with the kettlebells. Right. Not excited to do that. So it's much, much more likely to not occur if I wait till the night first off. And then I agree with you. So like you mentioned, when yeah. you fast and you want to deplete those glycogen stores. So basically that glycogen store is a reserved sugar. So you've basically reserved some sugar for when you need it for energy. And once you fasted, like you have overnight, you have access to those a little bit easier. And so you're right. going to use that access in the morning. And so that right. helps. Plus yeah. it helps with circadian rhythm. So it's also going to be positive on you getting sleep. Now I do think we mentioned this in one of our early, early sleep episodes. I did read a book and then I had a study in it that said the best time to work out was around two to four in the afternoon for sleep. Um, but you know, for most people, that's not really accessible. That's, that's not really yeah, a, most a, people are working, right? right? That's not really a good time to work to, or to work out. Yeah. So I agree. The best time is in the morning, but really the best time is whenever you can actually get to the gym and work out and put your all into that workout. Yes. And I, and I agree with that. And, but you want to make sure it's sustainable. And so my favorite time to work out is in the morning. However, I have not worked out in the morning in over two years, my, my workout time <laughs> And my Please workout come. time is 7 p.m. It's after the workday. And the, the thing that keeps me consistent with that is I, I text out to a group that I meet. So I'm, I ha I'm there. Mm -hmm. I have to be there. So that helps me get there. Yeah. But yeah, if I had my choice, it would be in the morning. For fat loss, I'd say all things being good. You're getting enough sleep. You know, you're eating appropriately, all that stuff. Uh, morning would probably be the best time. Do you, have you, how do you, um, like not disturb your sleep, Gianni? So have you ever had that? So I, my workouts rarely go over a half hour. Mm -hmm. So they, so I'm usually back home definitely before eight. I'm in bed by like, uh, nine 30. And now it, I've been doing it so long. It doesn't, it doesn't mess with my sleep. Like it, okay. like if I do it sporadically. Yeah. So I think if you're going to do it, like you said, pick a time that you know you can do it and be consistent, even if it's at night. And usually your your body will fall in line with that. Yeah. And the more consistency you set around that time, the more, like you said, your body will fall in line, the circadian rhythm, all these sorts of things will start coming together. Yeah. But for fat loss, I agree with you. Morning. Yeah. Yep. And, and so the other thing we talked about, another lifestyle thing is, okay, this is what we hear all the time. And I know you've heard this with personal training and, and doctors recommend it too, is you need to eat meals every two to three hours for, to keep maintain your muscle. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no evidence for that. I, I don't know where that comes from or why that, I, I think it comes from, I think it just comes from like, keep your blood sugar levels up. And, yeah. you know, so therefore you're, you're awake and alert. But if you are eating every couple hours, insulin levels go up every couple hours. You're never giving it a chance to come down, right? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And insulin is the, the locking and storing away hormone. So if you have insulin around all the time, you can't burn fat. It's hard to burn fat. So that's why you should eat discrete meals and try to give yourself a little bit more space between feeding times to enhance fat burning. Huh, yeah. Okay. Now that that's for the average person. Now, you know, if you are, if your profession is bodybuilding and stuff like that, which most right. of us, it is not, then that's a, that may be a whole different story. How yeah. you, how you want to do meal timing and stuff But for for the general public, I would say snacking is not a good thing to do for fat loss. So one of my first things that I do for fat loss with my patients is say, stop the snacking. You know, you don't need it. You want to create as much space between your meals that you can um, or more space than you normally do to allow insulin levels to start coming down so that you can start 
increase the burning fat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's another, uh, that's a myth that's out there. That is kind of, it's been out there. It's still out there where I think I've been a perpetuator it. of it before. We, oh, I, I me yeah. too. No doubt. You know, it's just something you've heard and you're just like, Oh, you just repeat it. Oh yeah. It's, but, <laughs> but you know, when you think about it, it's really not a good thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it makes so sense based, the, off, based off the insulin. Right. Right. Um, so that's one, that's one big thing. And, and that's why I think um, we talked about on our, inter, on our fasting episodes is, you know, that's why uh, intermittent fasting can really work for fat loss, you know, yeah. because you're, you're creating more space between meals and you're allowing those insulin levels to come down. And when insulin levels come down, your weight thermostat can reset down. So yeah. if you, your weight thermostat is set at like 200 pounds and you're trying to lose 10 pounds, if you put more space in there, over time, you're going to, well, over time, you're definitely, after a month, going to uh, decrease your caloric load, but you'll allow insulin levels to come down, which will lower that weight thermostat. Now you have a new set point. So it's not like this mm. perpetuating cycle of every five years that you gain 10 pounds and that's your new weight set point. It's like, oh yeah, when I was 20, you know, I weighed 170 pounds, but now I'm, I'm 50 and I, I weigh, you know, 220 pounds. You right. Know? And I can't, that's where my body wants to be. I can't lose it. So, so there's no doubt that the other thing is like, we, we can't get away from the calorie model. Right. So, right. so over time you want to decrease your, your calories over time. And so if you're, so two things, if you're sleeping longer, right. Sleep is incompatible with eating for most of us. <laughs> I've had some patients who actually <laughs> on certain medications <laughs> sleep eat. Yeah. <laughs> but but for most of us, you're not going to be eating while you're sound asleep. So so that's you know you're fasting. So the more sleep you get, that's one benefit of it. And then putting space between your meals, uh, you know, if you're busy at work, so on and so on, you get to decrease insulin. You get to deplete glycogen, and therefore your your body's like, well, we need a fuel source. Oh, we have all this fat stored around around your torso, so let's start burning that now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I don't, so snacking is not a good thing for most of us. There's, there's caveats to that, but, but even for, uh, you know, type two, type two diabetics where they're saying, Oh, you know, make sure your blood sugar levels are balanced snacking all the time and taking, you know, and having to shoot up insulin. Yeah. It may manage symptoms, but it's exactly the wrong thing you want to do to cure your diabetes. You want to put more space between your feeding time so insulin levels go down so you can decrease your medications and over time you can cure diabetes with creating more space between your meals. That's why intermittent fasting works great for type 2 diabetics that way. Wow. Yeah. I've definitely been a perpetuator of that myth. Yeah. Oh, I have. I have, I have too. And when you think about it, it just, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't wow. make sense. So one of the things for, for losing the extra weight is stop snacking make that a rule you know you're mm. just not going to snack sleep sleep a little bit more you know try to you know it's like you said and and with workouts the other thing i just want to say an, another another myth that's out there is that you have to exercise to lose weight to to burn fat um that's not necessarily true uh, especially in, when you compare it to your nutritional habits and your feeding right. habits yeah that's the first thing you need yeah. to do. So yep. if you are, if you can't work out for one reason or another, let's say your shoulders are injured and your knees are injured, everything you do hurts or whatever. Really, it's you want to concentrate on on putting space between meals and then, of course, eating eating appropriately. Yeah, and if you get that nutrition, I've seen this. You get the nutrition in check for a week or two. The th next time you try and exercise, you'll probably notice that it's a lot easier. You have yeah. that right fuel. Right. I've seen that too. Yeah. Um, so then the, the, the other thing is what about, what about your macros? So, so yeah. what type, what types of food should, should you eat? Pop tarts and things with high protein, <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, if it fits my right. macros, can we? <laughs> right, right. And, you know, again, I, I think if you're, if you're trying to, build muscle and stuff like that and not really trying to uh, burn fat or you're not a, a bodybuilder, but you're trying to build muscle, then, you know, their main thing is just getting in calories. Right. You know? 
And right. it really doesn't matter what kind of calories. I and mean, of course you want to try to eat healthy, but you, you want to get in calories. Right. But, but we're talking about loss, the opposite. Right. right. For fat loss, for the average person like me and you, it's like, yeah, you want to stay away from the, the processed foods and the most satiating macros are going to be things that are high in fiber and protein. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so making Seeds, sure nuts. those, yeah, those things actually, it's interesting. Nuts, nuts are very interesting because they're a very high calorie food, but the research on nuts, is fascinating. People who have like a, a handful of nuts a day seem to be more, uh, height weight proportion than people that don't. Yeah. So nut, I would consider nuts a, uh, a fat loss food, but they're, they're packed okay. full of, they have protein, lots of fiber and fat, and they just help satiate. Yeah. So that's, a handful, not a mouthful. Yeah, and and talk, fat loss number fat loss. T here's a fat loss tip. And with nuts, what happens is if they're salted or sweetened right. or flavored, you're gonna eat more than you would if they weren't. Yep. So there's a tip: like get your nuts, try to get them raw. Yeah, not take out all those artificial flavors. Yeah, really, take out take out the flavorings and all that stuff. Try to get them raw or or roasted. But but again. Raw almonds compared to roasted almonds, which one do you think you're going to eat more of? You're going to eat right. more of the roasted almonds, you know? Well, and I don't know if you had this, Keone, but I definitely had it in college where I started making more educated choices just about what I was eating. And slowly, I became desensitized to those types of foods. And now, this is, I'll, I'll admit this, but it's, it's Halloween's coming up. We were in the <laughs> store the other day, and it was like, you know, I haven't had a gummy, like, candy whatever it be, right. gummy bear, gummy worm. And I don't know how long. And we got gummy worms and I took one bite of it. And I was like, that is foul. And yeah. I would love them as a kid. And so I just burned your tongue off. <laughs> Damn near. <laughs> and so it, when you get to the, you desensitize yourselves from all those sugar and the balance of going up, down, up, down and all that kind of stuff. And then you get to try it again after a year or two with those. And it's, it's, it's completely changed. Right. You're not on that sugar salt rush that the world is trying to give you more or less with these foods that are out there. Right. Yeah. And, and so if you can decrease your refined sugar load, you actually, when you taste it again, it's like with sodas, if you can desensitize mm -hmm. yourself to sodas, you really don't ever want to go back. Cause it's like drinking. Yeah. Like now you do, you're like, your sugar. That? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, oil. It's like, yeah. It's like too sweet. And mm -hmm. yeah. So, the other thing that's speaking of nuts, right? So um, there's this whole thing about slow foods, foods that you have to eat slow. So mm. would it be better to eat nuts that are shell that are already that are in the shell or nuts that are unshelled? So when you have to right. work to crack them open and eat them. So on my on my table and counter, I have them in caps. I have a bowl of nuts, shelled nut. I buy them at the food store. And if I'm snacking, you know, you just crack crack them open with a cracker and Again, you can't take a whole handful and just shove it in your mouth. It has to be one at a time. And you know, so you're, eat, you're forced to eat it slowly. Right. And therefore, your body can catch up and you are satisfied after just a few. You know? Yeah. So, so any, any food that you kind of have to uh, prepare, uh, work, prepare yeah. or work at a slow food is, you know, is, is going gonna, is gonna to help. So that just goes back to, again, more time between eating food, <laughs> even if it's that two yeah. seconds versus milliseconds of mouthfuls, mouthfuls, mouthfuls. Right. Because you, you actually will, will that, that hunger sensation, you'll, you'll be satiated right. by eating a lot less if you eat slowly. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm terrible at that because if, I have, if I'm hungry and I have food in front of me, I eat way too fast yeah yep I mean, I, same the, if the bag yeah. is open the bag will be gone it right. needs to be a bowl or <laughs> it needs to be a small portion or else i'm going to eat the whole right. portion so so we're talking about slowing things down so you're right so how what do you if you have a bag of i don't know chips mm -hmm. sitting on your countertop when you come in from from think about it from your day of yeah. seeing patients right and it's just sitting there oh. as opposed to that same bag being up in a cabinet somewhere behind something. So when you open the cabinet, you have to reach for it or you don't necessarily see it. Right. And, you know, that's going to help you with fat loss more than anything. Yeah.
you know? So, and there are studies on this. So if you have soda that's left out on the counter or a candy bowl or anything like that, invariably you're going to be fatter than somebody who has the same food, but you kind of have to work for it or you have to reach up for it or if it's behind something. So it's that whole saying, add a sight, you know, yep. add a mind, add a reach, add a stomach. So you kind of have to make sure you work for your, you know, comfort foods to some, in some sense, don't just have them sitting out. It's very yeah. easy after your yeah. willpower batteries drain and you have a bag of chips, you just pop it open and then you can eat a whole bag of chips and they're, they're rarely satisfying. I mean, you can eat the whole bag and you know, how do you know? And, <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Cause you can eat the whole bag and it's just not going to do anything for you. And then, you know, and then you, then you create this whole mental game and beat yourself up like, Oh, you know what? <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's kind of it's 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 kind of funny how we psychologically play games with ourselves, you know. Yeah, with absolutely, absolutely. So I know one that we've mentioned um, uh, with our. Anyway, I know we've mentioned our me, coffee topics. Yeah, can you hear me? I guess not. You you broke out. Can you hear me, Kenny? All right, now now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Seems like okay. the internet is is kind of slow. So I know another one we've talked about is coffee being satiating or helping uh -huh. continue that that full feeling. Yep. Do you yeah. start with a cup of coffee in the morning or no? I I a very small cup of coffee in the morning and it's great. To, it, it does just help quell hunger and I can usually go I can usually extend my fast with like black coffee something yeah. about the the bitterness bitterness compounds or whatever mm -hmm. seem to have a slight satiating effect on on a lot of people uh -huh. so saying coffee has that um, okay. so and and so coffee is a good one black coffee without the calories may take the edge off where you know you can get by and wait till lunch tell you, yeah. you actually eat something and i would say the same thing about cocoa raw cocoa powder mixed in mm -hmm. hot water we talked about that too that mm -hmm. may also help those yeah. are two herbs there's not like there's not like i guess what coffee there is is some okay research on it maybe helping with fat loss not a lot of great research on pure cocoa powder but it does at least for me clinically and for my patients does seem to help um satisfy yeah. And I know at least subjectively, if you're trying to make a change and you're, let's say uh, you used to have coffee with the creamer and the syrups and God knows what else I put in there. And yep. then you just change that to coconut oil and coffee. Mm -hmm. And then initially I get resistance from people that I talk to about this because it's a fat and they're freaking right. out about the fact that it's a fat. But then right. that just goes back to what you said about satiating foods versus not satiating food. So it's not like we're taking a huge tub of coconut oil and dumping it in our coffee, but that little bit of fat is just going to be much more satiating than the whipped mocha peppermint candy that they drizzled on top of the coffee. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be much different for how you're going to feel the rest of the day or how much you're going to be satiated throughout the morning. And so if you can use that as a bridge, if you're making changes, from your previous type of coffee or just whatever you used to do initially to maybe one of these more fattier meals in the beginning, it'll allow you to eat less throughout the day. Maybe skip that mid morning snack or at the end of the day, decrease the calories in some, some fashion that at the end of the day, right. it does break down to unfortunately calories in calories out. It is yep. almost that simple and we just complicate it. Right. But you, but there is some research on there. There's research on, using those um, MCT oils mm -hmm. that are found yep. like the medium chain triglycerides that are found in coconut oil. There are some meta analysis that will show that using that as a weight loss herb or, or fat a spoonful of that does help. So that is supported by research. And that's why, you know, adding the fat to the coffee may, may really help. I yeah. tell my, I tell my patients that um, and my clients that if you're going to do that, um, consider it a meal, just mm. consider it a meal. So you're having your, your, you know, coffee with fat, just consider it a meal. Don't eat again until, and a lot of people say, well, I don't want to eat anyway when I do that. Right. Yep. And, and so coconut oil or, or those, those, uh, medium chain triglycerides have research supporting that it may, that it does help with some fat loss. Yeah. Yeah. So you Another can definitely back that one up. Yep. And another one of my favorite, and this one, 
maybe you can back this one up with some research. I haven't done no research on it, but subjectively, I love when I first get a personal training client is just 16 ounces of water as soon as you wake up, whether it's oh, that's huge. room temperature, but really just to get the metabolism started. A lot of people you come to find even like at the, at a physical therapy clinic, you know, if I'm there at seven in the morning and they're coming for their first appointment, they more or less just rolled out of bed and we haven't right. had any water. We haven't done anything to prepare for mm-hmm. moving or anything like that. So we haven't kickstarted our system at all. So then you're going to come see me, you're going to work out or get a little bit of a sweat going, and then you're going to leave here and pr- and go eat something like a cereal bowl. And that's just right. going to kickstart the rest of your day on this sugar up, down, up, down, up, down, kind of the insulin that you were referring to. And you're just right. And keep I snacking. And, yeah. And I, I, I mean, again, that's a fat loss rule that will, I'll tell my clients and patients is before you eat, if you can install one, another fat loss rule is have a glass of water before every meal also, <laughs> you know, because that it, because it, it will do a number of things, right? It will tell you for one thing, if you're really hungry, you can determine between physical hunger and emotional hunger. Yep. Right. So if you're really hungry and you have that glass of water, um, if you're physically hungry within minutes of drinking that big glass of water, you're going to be hungry. If yeah. it's emotional hunger and you do that, you're going to be like, yo, well, I'm not really hungry anymore. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So, so what, if you can do that, that's a great fat loss rule right there. Like drink, drink plenty of water. Yeah. Right. And kickstart it in the day. That's I and love kick, that. And so. kickstart it in the definitely kickstart in the, in the day. Don't and don't let the water, you know, your fluid intake influence, you know, or hurt your sleep. Mm-hmm. So yep. get most of your water in the day and then kind of taper off if you're yep. somebody who's, you know, waking up two to three times a night to urinate. Yeah. You know, to pee. So that that's one thing that can really really help. Yeah. Um. Uh, so there's another herb out there that people can can certainly drink. It has some research on fat burning, and the, the, this is you're not gonna probably not gonna see like a huge fat burning, you know, weight or fat a lot of weight loss with it. But it can help, and that's drinking green tea. Mm. You know, again, unsweetened green tea. It's kind of like the black coffee or the or the cocoa. That certainly can help too. Yeah. So so green tea with your meals. Of course, you want to drink it unsweetened. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, and I would the, say, the and candies. I would say this also that, you know, drink your green tea and probably don't rely on green tea supplements. Those green tea supplements, uh, you know, I use them in my, my practice, but I use them for specific things clinically. And if you're just popping green tea supplements all the time, there, there can be some, there's been some studies out about liver, liver issues by taking too much green tea extracts and stuff like that. So I just tell people to make sure you don't see that when you're consuming green tea, like drinking it and brewing it yourself. Okay. Okay. So it's a, so that's the thing. And plus, you know, doing green tea, again, that's another way to hydrate and plus the compounds in there may help with, with fat loss. Yeah. On a similar tea note, one tea that I like to suggest if people are, let's say you're trying to lean out for the beach, like in a week, that sort of Mm -hmm. thing. Uh, I'll have you load up on water and then three or four days before you start getting ready to go to the beach, start including some dandelion tea because it's a diuretic. So you're going to start bringing all that water out of your system and hopefully following the salt all the way out of your system. So that can help lean you out in the very, very short term. This is not like a long-term weight loss tip. It's more of a, I want to go to the beach in a week and I feel yeah. a little extra puffed. That'll kind right, of right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're exactly right. Dandelion, dandelion does have a bit of a diuretic effect. That's, that's no doubt. And, and because of that also, if, uh, you know, when you have a diuretic effect, usually salt follows, which gets rid of the puffiness. Right. Um, and also people have issues with blood pressure. Well, I use dandelion tea to help lower blood pressure because of that. So you will, you will help lower blood pressure over time and you're not going to have any problem drinking dandelion tea long term. I mean, it's a very, very safe herb mm. and it grows everywhere. Damn, it <laughs> grows everywhere. Um, so yeah, the, I, that's a, that's a good one. Um, as far as like, uh, going back to the macros, I, I do think like eating a uh, lower, definitely try to get the refined carbs out. Um, 
And uh, if oh, yeah, you have hijacked wait, the macros completely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, no, yeah, but it, and it's it's important. It's really important because you know I really do think like to think about as far as the macros go, which ones are going to elevate insulin the most, and which ones are more satiating. We know refined carbs, mm-hmm. the chips, the breads, the pastas, the the cakes, cookies, all that stuff is going to raise insulin. It's going to shut off fat burning. So, you know, your carbs really should move more towards the ones that are high fiber or the starchy vegetable carbs. Like let's think sweet potatoes. Um, um, I don't know. Most Squashes. of those are easy to find because they grow in the ground and they didn't come yeah. from the box. Right. Right. Just a and, general rule of thumb. And, and here's something that's really surprising, Ryan, is I, I tell, I do tell people like part of, um, enjoying a meal is getting that sated effect where you feel like I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. And, and there is one, you know, the, the most satiating food out there is white potato and Hmm. white potato gets a bad rap. You know Um, I think when you eat fried potatoes that we, you know, most Americans eat where they're salted, you have them with ketchup and stuff like that. Now that's an issue. (laughs) But if you're doing a regular baked potato with the skin without throwing a bunch of stuff on it, um, that's probably going to help with fat loss because it's going to satiate you. Yeah. All right. And, and again, I, that's not a refined carb. That's something you would, you would prepare. But overall, when we talk about what macronutrients are going to help with fat loss, you really think about protein and, and fiber. And in those starchy carbs, you're getting, you're getting a lot of fiber in there. Yeah. So it's refined carbs you really want to think about. So it's like if you can eliminate the refined carbs, it's great. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, CUNY, is fat not as satiating? I think it is like protein, fat, carbohydrates, right? As far as satiating goes. I can, so fat, fat is interesting because right. fat seems to have a, compared to carbs and protein and their effects on insulin, fat seems to have a neutralizing effect where it doesn't do a whole lot with insulin. So that's why the ketogenic mm-hmm. diet can help with fat loss. So if you do a very high fat diet, like a ketogenic diet, Mm -hmm. The insulin levels are not raising, are not going up as high as they would if you added lots of, lots of protein and carb to it. So that's why it seems to, at least in the research, have more of a fat burning effect, the ketogenic diet. So, so fat, I consider more neutral and you bring up something good because we talked about this before, as far as like reading labels. And if you wanted a when we say a fat loss food, and this is more specific to processed foods. If you look at the nutrition label and what's in one serving, you take the total number of carbs in that serving and subtract out the protein and subtract out the fiber. And if that carb number is 10 or less, it's going to help with satiation and maybe, and have more potential to help you with fat burning. So let's, so for example, let's say you're trying to pick out a cereal a yeah. processed food yeah. and when one serving and so you had get 40 grams of carbs in there mm-hmm. and now you see the amount of fiber in there and this is typical of cereals so the fiber in there let's say is three grams okay yeah. and the amount of protein in there is i don't know let's just say 17 grams when you take that 40 grams minus 17 minus three you're left with a total net carb of 20 right that's probably not going to help you a whole lot with fat loss. Okay. But on the other hand, if you get a protein bar where you have something like 20 grams of carbs, 17 grams of protein and three grams of fiber, now your net carb is zero. So that's a less than 10. So that would, as a snack, that's probably going to do better for you and be more satiating. And when you say do better for me, it's just not as high in carbs and it's more satiating. It's more satiating and, and it's not as high in carb, has less of an effect on, on insulin, allows you to burn fat over time in the long run and allows you to eat less over time in the long run. Okay. And here, here's the other thing about fiber that I tell people. Fiber is, is you know, fiber by itself may not be the, the end all be all for, for fat loss, mm-hmm. but when you do fiber and water together, it, it enhances the satiating effect. Mm-hmm. Think about soluble fiber and how you know, it just help. it like absorbs water and expands in your stomach. And, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it satiates you that way. Exactly. So one, you're literally filling volume. You're there's filling one. volume. And there's yeah. one fiber out there that does that really, really well. And that's glucomannan. 
and glucose. glucose. So you see these glucomanning supplements out there. It's a fiber that kind of like absorbs water and kind of expands in your stomach and you just digest it. And there's a particular food out there the uh, Japanese use a lot. It's called shirataki noodles. They're made of glucomannan. And they're great for like if you want pasta meals. Um, they're great in stir fries. Hmm. And, um, you know, they, they're, they're zero carb. Is there another food, Keone, that is high in the glucomane? Um, there, let me think. Um, it's going to be various it forms. Too. It's going to be various forms of of those those noodles they come in cubes or they'll come in like a, a like a noodle but there are you know they it, it is interesting talking about some like stereotypical japanese um foods there is another herb out there that seems to that seems to help with and a lot of and americans don't don't eat a whole lot of it and it's seaweed yeah so like brown seaweed in your in your daily diet, there is some research that shows that uh, a certain compound in like brown seaweeds it's called fucoxanthin, hmm. um, you know, helps with seems to help with satiation, helps with ins improving insulin levels, um, helps decrease uh, white adipose tissue. So there's research on that. Um, and animal research, and it's certainly not going to hurt. And this is, you know, seaweed is more stereotypically known to be part of the Asian diet, specifically the Japanese. Okay. Can you diet. spell um, for me gluco, the glucomane, just because when I try and Google it to find out more foods, yep. I'm automatically getting suggestions for, no, you meant glutamine, man. Okay. Glu glucomannan is G-L-U-C-O-M-A-N-N-O-N. -N -N -N. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right, there we go. Yeah, so that that one can help quite a bit. There's another condiment food out there that may also help. Well, there's a number of condiments, but one is vinegar. Okay. So adding vinegar to your, lots of vinegar to your salads and stuff may have a satiating effect. I think that um, speaks to kind of the, the uh, not the acidity, but what were you, the more bitterness um that you were talking which i guess would somewhat be acidity yeah it, well it's it, there's something about yeah i think you're right something about that acid mm -hmm. taste seems to seems to help with insulin levels just seems to have somewhat of a satiating effect so i it, it's it, it can help a lot but even go let's go even more like all right lifestyle choice so if you go out to eat and we talked about water. Um, what watery foods are more satiating? So, so it's best to get a soup over a sandwich, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you had to choose, soups yeah. are more watery based. Soups usually have you know a lot more fiber in it than sandwiches, also, especially like vegetable soup. So, soup can help. Yeah, and soups on top of that, it speaks to the volume aspect, like you're right. And so, and the other thing it speaks to volume is soups and salads as opposed to sandwiches and i don't know pizzas or burritos or, or whatever those things can can really help a lot by yeah. just like increasing that. volume that are low low calorie like that darn super magical summer salt metabolic effect salad that takes yeah, so what long episode? to eat yeah that was an episode from our first year way back yeah the the rainbow i'm still making it <laughs> okay. once a month we're making yeah, that probably that's funny because i've gotten complaints about that style the main complaint was it takes so long to chew <laughs> yep yeah definitely definitely yeah. well that, when it does hour. that that that's how you know it has high, high fiber uh -huh. you know that you're getting a lot of high fiber and, there. and, a, and a lot of yeah and a lot of uh phytonutrients yeah so that's a fat loss tip i would say soups and salads over sandwiches and you know, whatever else, pizzas or whatever, if you, yeah. if you had a choice. Yeah. So get more bang for your volume, more right. nutrition in your volume overall. Right. Right. So we talked about slow foods, but just the act of eating and chewing slowly. Right. And some foods like that salad will force you to do that yeah. is, is something that can, can really, really help yeah. um, just slow you down. Um, here's a big fat loss tip liquid calories like you know if you're doing sodas and 
I would even say smoothies and consider them snacks and things like that. Those liquid calories, most people psychologically don't think about them as a meal, but calorically they are a meal. Some of them are two meals. So yeah. think about the Starbucks, you know, big yeah. boo-boo coffee with the whipped cream on top, you know, <laughs> 3000 calorie drink, you drink it down and you're like psychologically, you think, well, it was only a drink, you yeah. know, but no, it's a meal. Yeah. And, um, Stay away from those big boo boo coffees, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> they 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 don't help. They're not going to help you. Uh -huh. And and I would and the interesting thing, a lot of these non calorie sweetened drinks like diet sodas um, seem to trick the body into making you want to eat later. You know, you know, like a few days down the road more than you normally would because it's it they they call it like the cephalic phase response where your body is tasting sweet, but not actually getting the calories. So over time, the body almost like jump starts to be like, well, where are my calories? And, and then unconsciously makes you eat more later. Mm, yeah. you know, not, and, and, and that's the least of the worries with those because there's research on diet sodas, increasing morbidity and mortality over regular sodas. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's crazy to me. So then you're talking about what's going on with those artificial sweeteners and stuff. You know? Yeah, I just wouldn't drink the stuff that melts things, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. So it goes, back, it goes back to the whole foods. But a lot of people don't, um, you know, when we talk about liquid calories, don't really think about alcohol as being calories, you yeah, know? Yeah, absolutely. Not only and, that, but it's, it's sugar. Yeah, and, and what carbs. it does, I mean, on, at the very basic level, it, we alcohol, if we know anything in the research, we know alcohol is a known toxin. We know that, right? Yeah. I mean, your liver has to process that like you wouldn't believe. And, um, you know, if at the very least, you should be following one drink with a big glass of water, mm. you know? Now having one drink, you know, on the weekends or, or whatever, it's unlikely that you're going to see any problem with inhibiting fat loss. However, doing it day in and day out and, and drinking a lot of alcohol, that's a lot of calories. You know, Keone, it's, it's somewhat of a tangent, but do you know any of the research regarding protein synthesis and alcohol? Mm -mm. What do you mean? Like, like I've heard you don't want to drink alcohol on the same day you lift heavy because it stops protein synthesis or just, I, I've heard these myths and I haven't had the time to really look into them, but yeah, I was I just wondering if you've I, heard any of those. I don't know. That's a, that's a okay. good question for uh, Jade. He, for a new topic. Might, right. Yeah, get him see back. See you back on. with a new him. episode. <laughs> yeah. Get, see, see what he says. He may have even done a, I think he did on T Nation or something he like may that. Have I done may have something read on T Nation. He may have done something on T Nation about that. And that's why I know so little. And... That's the extent of my research was Jay's yeah. one article. Yeah. Okay. He and he actually did a quite a bit on the whole alcohol thing and fat burning and stuff. And what I came away with it, it, it you know, of course it depends on how you're doing it. But what I do know is if you're if you're having one to two drinks every single night, yeah, you're gonna inhibit for your fat loss. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a question for him. Um, another fat loss tip. I think we briefly talked about this a while ago is <laughs> have you seen those, those memes of like, like plates from the 1940s and fifties compared to the plates now? Uh -huh. So you're talking about, you know, little dinner, dinner plates in the fifties were like this big. Uh -huh. And now we have dinner plates this big, you know? Yeah. So psychologically, what does that do to the mind? Like if you, you fill, fill up space. your dinner on a, on a little plate and you eat one plate, you're going, well, psychologically, I had a plate of food, yeah. you know, it was on that little plate. But now if you have it here, you're I, like, still, had well, a plate, I still had Danny. a plate of food. Yeah. So the bigger it goes, <laughs> you know, so small plates and utensils are, are, are big. It's fascinating. They've done studies on this, like with cup size too as far mm. as liquid calories and it's yeah. a psychological aspect of, well, you know, I only had, you know, it was a tall skinny glass of alcohol as opposed to a short fat glass of alcohol, which one had more calories. It was still one glass, you know, even though yeah. one, one of those glasses may have a lot more alcohol in it yeah. or a lot more volume in it. Um, but yeah, smaller, smaller plates um, seem, seem to help. And so there's a lot going on with environmental food cues right yeah absolutely
so it's talking about like coded lies right (laughs) yeah Yeah. it's like talking if if you see the food right again out of sight out of mind if you see the food you're going to be likely unconsciously to start eating it so i i remember when i was working as a uh, engineer, you know, I was, I had my cubicle, like it was a stereotypical office space type scenario. I and every wish I cub- could see it. Oh my God. <laughs> every cubicle had their little bowl of like treats, yeah. you know? Yep. And by the end of the day, you basically ate a pack of Tootsie Rolls, <laughs> yeah. you know, by just picking the whole day. Yeah. So out of sight, out of mind. With stay all out of the break stuff. room. Stay out, stay out of the break room, that type of thing. Yes. Um, uh, another thing that I, I think definitely thinking about food triggers. So mm, a lot of mm. people will sit in front of TV or their computer and just the act of doing that since they've done it so much and created a habit makes them want to eat. Yeah. So it's like, think about sitting, sitting down for the football game and well, I can't sit down to the football game without having like my chicken wings and my, you know, popcorn and my beer and yeah. stuff like that. And a lot of times that translates over to anything. And then uh, on top of that, if you're watching news, what does the stress psychologically do to you to watch news? If the news stresses you out, you know, you may want to eat then too. So, so a lot, so a lot of times the TV or the computer can be a trigger. So a lot of times I'll tell my patients, like really watch that, like try to turn the electronic stuff off when you're eating and, and focus on eating. Yeah. Instead of like, you know, having your mind focused on something else where you're unconsciously eating and, you know, by the time the program's over, you're like, geez, I just ate three plates of food, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. As we go into the holidays, since this will come out in November, one thing I suggest is just in the holidays, isn't the time to take off from the workout. Now that you are sleeping and you have more time, you're eating more, all those sorts of things, you're not as stressed out at work. I would say Thanksgiving day is not necessarily the day where it's like, okay, we can blow off the gym. That's the day I would still definitely make sure to go to the gym and all those days off that you have on the Thanksgiving break. Cause that little bit, and I notice it with myself and just with clients is that you see like this, this cyclic cyclical nature of every year or two, I add five pounds every year or two, I add five pounds. And I think it starts with this kind of holiday season In the holiday season, you maybe gain 10 pounds and then you start the New Year's resolution and you lose eight Mm -hmm. and then you hover with two more pounds and you just continue to do that your entire life, basically. Right. And that weight thermostat raises. Yeah, as the years go by, that weight thermostat goes up and up. And one key point I tell people also is, okay, so you have a big Thanksgiving meal drink a lot of alcohol, you're with family and friends, you have basically continuous meal from three o'clock, you watch the games all the way until, this is the way my family does it, all the way until like 10 or 11, (laughs) or or you pass out. Or, and then you pass out, you know, like, (laughs) like sometimes I'll see, you know, one of my brothers go, go, go wobble off, go wobble off somewhere into the back bedroom, fall asleep around six or seven o'clock in the evening get up an hour later and walk back in and eat again. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. it's like this cycle. So when, you know, and most of us will overdo it on those meals, just being around family and friends. That's another food cube. Just being around family and friends and sitting around the table with food in front of you, you're just going to eat. Yeah. One thing that is really helpful, do not get up the next day. Definitely do your workout the next day, but, but more, more beneficial than that, is do not get up the next day, extend your fast. You don't need breakfast after you just had an all night of eating, mm, you know? Mm, so mm. you can extend your meal out again. It may be good. That may be when you want to do a 24 or 18 hour fast using sleep time. So, you know, you ended your meal, last bite of food was around 9 p.m. You know, probably wait until five or six the next day when you're really hungry to eat again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now, to, give, to give your time, your body time to have the insulin levels lower. Now, let me ask you about this because I've, no, I've, this is only even from just personal experience. Let's say the Auburn football team is playing a huge game. It's our one day off. I know that day I'm going eating chicken wings, two beers, right. da, 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 da. Those days where I wake up after that, for some reason, I wake up and I'm hungrier. Mm-hmm. So what can I do or what do you suggest? And maybe this goes back to the coffee, the water, all those tips we talked about earlier. 
I know I need to extend my fast because yesterday I overate. It's, I know that. But I wake up for some reason so much hungrier. Like I'm already on that sugar yeah. low, ready to yeah. consume. What, should, what do you do or what do you recommend? Well, I, I, do, I do basically what you suggested at the beginning of this podcast. It's like drink, drink plenty of water, maybe have a cup of coffee if I do anything like that. You know, um, but typically for, for um, most people, when after you do that, the hunger sensation goes away. Mm, it just okay. goes away. So, uh, and, and, but for, at least for me, when I, when I do that, have a big meal, if I do that, I'm, I just, it just, I'm not hungry. I mean, I'm just, yeah. if as long as I start my day, it's like out of sight, out of mind. So the habit of always eating breakfast kind of can play a role into that. Yeah, you know, like definitely. psychologically, you think you need breakfast. And there's, there's research out there that says you should eat, you know, what's the most important meal of the day. And mm. invariably, it's always, well, you should always eat breakfast. Yeah. Well, that's not necessarily true if you just ate like the equivalent of two meals the night before. Right. You know, and especially if you're trying to, trying to lose fat, you really want to extend it, you yeah. know. Yeah, and I, I would say this, too. If you're like just so hungry in the morning again, it goes back to, okay, we'll try having a handful of some of those slow foods, right? Like mm. just have a little bit of nuts. Certainly don't have coffee and a donut, you know? Right. Yep. So yeah, if you need to eat something, definitely eat something. But I just tell people like after Christmas meal or Thanksgiving meal or, or a big meal out with friends, like, yeah, you probably want to want to fast. Okay. Yeah. Can you any of those tips that we left off? Um, let's see. And then I cut you off there. What were, what was your, I was just, I was thinking, um, well, I, you know, one thing, one thing that I think people really should do, and this is fascinating to me as I, I think people need to have objective measures about their weight. So I was going to speak on that as well, but go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I recommend people like use their scale and I know a lot of people are afraid of their scale but you need to get on there to see where you are. Because honestly, I've, I've had patients who are so afraid to scale and I, I think it helps keep us honest. And if you get on it like once a week or once every few days, it really does help you, at least what the research says, help you maintain a weight. Because at yeah. the end of the year, if you don't get on it and now you're up like 20 pounds, you know, which has happened with some of my patients, um, and even over the holiday, I think the average American, anywhere between five and 15 pounds you can gain over the holiday season. We're talking about the holiday season. I guess the, the stereotypical holiday season would be from Thanksgiving until after New Year's. Yeah. Yeah. So think about that. Yeah. Five to 15 pounds. Yeah. So I think measuring yourself, like I think a scale or a tape measure would just helps keep you honest and keep you on, on track. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I've gotten... Uh, I agree with the scale. And then I've also just things like I have patient or uh, clients who like use an Apple watch and then it has like an activity tracker on it. And for whatever they're worth at the very least, they give you the, 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 you want to complete those three circles of activity. They have like exercise movement and standing and right. at the very least. It makes people aware that, Holy shit, I only stood four hours today out of 12. Right. And I want to hit this or I only, walked around for 4,000 steps as opposed to eight or whatever the case may be. And just having those objective numbers, just like you mentioned with the scale can, uh, can kind of smack you right in the face and wake you up if, if you're looking at it the right way. Yeah. The, yeah. Those bio, the, anything that, that can measure your sleep, your, your activity level is very helpful, your weight, uh, and you should definitely use those. Um, there's one thing that you can do. There's, a number of things that we didn't mention, but one thing that uh, helps is spicy food. If you like spicy mm. food, really spicing your food, using your spices, um, I, especially like cayenne or something like that. Um, if you get really, really spicy food, it will shut off that hunger signal very quick, not to mention your mouth will be burning. Yeah, and you increase your thermogenesis, so you're burning more calories Poss- in theory, yeah, there's some re- possibly. There's some research that, that indicates that. And we um, see that with contrast baths as well, I believe. So like a really hot bath, you're going to raise your core temperature and you keep switching back and forth. You're basically causing yourself to elevate, to adjust inside, almost like you're working out, but with a, mm-hmm. with a, uh, hot, yeah, cold, and, hot, and, cold and the extreme, the extremes go the other way. So we taught one of our podcasts, we talk about using cold to help with weight 
you know, to help burn mm-hmm. calories, right? So the cold bath and stuff like that. Yeah, then you're forced to work harder to keep yourself warmer and right. that's gonna burn calories. Right, so, and I don't know, I, what else? I think I hit on everything that I, that I wanted to hit on. Yeah, I think those are our quick and dirty tips. Yeah, for sure. And 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 a lot of, and a lot of those things. I mean, some of those things are just from my clinical experience, but a lot of those things are backed up by with mm-hmm. research. And we and we talked about a couple herbs um, in there that can really really help. And you know, uh, fiber, which can come from a number of plants like psyllium seed, flax seed, you know, cereal grains. That you you want to increase that. Green tea is another herb. Um, we talked about coconut oil that, you know, again, the, the MCT oils can help. Um, yep. you know, at the end of the day though, we, we can't, we, we can't just ignore calories. So we, we really have to be aware of that. And that's why I really like the, you know, create more space between your meals. If you stop the snacking at the end of the month, it's going to be unbelievable where you are in your cal- caloric deficit. You know, I mean, sometimes you can have a caloric deficit at the end of the month that's like upwards of 10,000 calories that you didn't consume. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you start thinking about those, those drinks that you're mentioning or the candy bowl that you're not tracking or mindful of. Right. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I think that covers most of everything. Uh, One podcast that I want to do at some point is just talk about, we talked about a few, is just talk about herbs that can be used for fat loss. Yeah. We'll do that soon. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Maintain it through the holiday season. Drink your water, get your exercise, eat your satiating foods, and we look forward to talking with you next week. See you, everybody.